Remembrance Day. What happened during World War I? I'm Marco Perry. Welcome to the Perry Platform. Today we celebrate Remembrance Day. It marks the end of World War I and I thought it would be a fitting moment to do a little bit of remembering. Today we're going to talk about World War I, but before that, Remembrance Day. It's meant to serve as a day where people pay respect to the members of the armed forces who fought for the freedoms that we hold dear. In Canada, it's a statutory holiday in all territories and six provinces, except for Nova Scotia, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. If you're from those provinces, it's not a statutory holiday for you, unfortunately. So now let's dive in to World War I. There's a lot of cool details and facts about it that maybe we're forgetting about. It's the perfect time to do some remembering. So according to the Canadian Encyclopedia, it was the bloodiest conflict in Canada's history. More than 60,000 Canadians died. The conflict started in 1914 with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He was the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, so it's a pretty big deal. Think of Game of Thrones. If the prince got killed, Cersei would go to war for that quite easily. This is what triggered the war. He was the heir to the throne, and tensions in Europe were pretty high even prior to the assassination. That was the tipping point though. After that, all hell broke loose. So Austria-Hungary blamed the Serbian Empire and the Serbian government for the attack. From here, all the chaos stemmed forward. Russia supported Serbia, so Austria was kind of reluctant to really go at them right away. They didn't want to take on those two guys alone, so they needed their own backup. This came in the form of Germany. Germany gave them a form of insurance, basically saying, if you go to war, we have your back. So with that in their pocket, Austria felt a little bit more confident, and they went to Serbia and gave them an ultimatum. This is before the war even started. The option was that they allow Austria to perform their own investigation into the assassination. They have to also suppress anti-Austrian propaganda, and they have to take steps to eliminate terrorist organizations on their border because they suspected that the terrorist organizations were the ones responsible for the assassination. If Serbia did not want to comply with that, there was option two, which was basically combat. Serbia was given 48 hours to respond, and I'm sure you know what happened. They did not comply. They felt that Austria-Hungary was already readying for war, so they took measures into their own hands as well, and they went to Russia. They tried to ready their own forces. They weren't wrong though, because soon after, Austria did in fact declare war, because the terms in that ultimatum were not met. Looking back, it would be interesting to see what would have happened if they did agree to those terms, but that's neither here nor there. Maybe in the hypothetical world, that could have been a possibility, but instead we got World War I. So Russia and Serbia brought in more allies, and early on, it was Russia, Belgium, France, Britain, and Serbia versus Austria-Hungary and Germany. This is where Canada gets involved too. So we didn't choose to enter the war based on our own accord, but we did have an allegiance with the British government, and since they were involved, we were basically involved too. That's the deal here, and you could say that we had no choice in the matter. Shortly after the fighting began, and Germany was fighting on two fronts from the very beginning. They tried to invade France at the same time they went after Russia. Two different fronts that they were fighting on. Germany was technologically advanced, and they steamrolled through Belgium to get into France. They actually penetrated France a little bit before they were held off. So once they got into that, Britain came to France in defense and they created a joint effort. And they were able to hold back Germany's advances, but many lives were lost on both sides. The estimates are in the millions. On the other side of Europe, Russia was pushing into Germany, but they were soon stopped by a German and Austrian force. You can just imagine, death and destruction on both fronts everywhere you look. East or West, people are getting slaughtered by the thousand. And each party is looking to get another inch on the opposition, slowly creeping towards that capital to take you over. Very scary times. So Russia didn't do too well soon after that, and their own people started to rebel actually. It was an internal struggle, as well as the external war efforts pushing in on them. They experienced defeat in the battlefield one too many times, which was partnered with bad economic conditions and a lack of resources. People were having a hard time feeding themselves, there was not enough to drink, they were losing battles in the war, the economy was terrible, there weren't many jobs. That's a recipe for a revolt. Eventually, a full-on revolution did break out, and now Russia was trying to contain the internal turmoil 
while trying to balance things on the battlefield. It was a disaster. Now, back to Canada. It felt like for a brief period of time, the left and the right parties were united in a common effort. The conservative government was urged by the liberal opposition to take powers under the War Measures Act. Before long though, military spending equated our entire government budget and we were losing money. Britain couldn't afford to lend us anything because they were involved in the war themselves. So, Canada had to figure out our way to finance this costly endeavor. The answer to that was basically bonds. Asking citizens to loan the government money and this was one of the main ways that we financed our war effort. From 1913 to 1918, national debt in Canada went from $463 million to $2.46 billion. Try to imagine how much that would be in today's dollars. $2 billion in 1918? That's mind-blowing. The bottom line, war is expensive. So near the start of the war, Canada set a target for 50,000 recruits for their expeditionary forces, but in 1915, they already had 150,000 people. The number continued to grow from there. We were considered a part of the British Army, and Canada had some serious contributions abroad in the war effort. You can say we kind of carved a name for ourselves from all the success we had. One of the more popular battles is the Battle of Vimy Ridge, a Canadian treasure, you could say, a treasured memory of Canada and the war. The Germans held the high ground in the ridge, Vimy's Ridge, which matters a lot on the battlefield. When you have the high ground, you can just fire downwards at people trying to run up at you, and it also comes with a strategic cover and allows you to just mow people down. It's very advantageous. This area was once regarded as a seemingly impenetrable fortress by the Allies, until Canada came in. In five days, we took it. The Canadian Lieutenant General, Arthur Currie, decided against attacking head-on, but instead he diverted to a nearby hill. He was trying to flank them. They took position on top of the hill and mounted up. They started to fire back at the opposition, and from there they expanded. This removed some aspect of the high ground benefit that the Germans had. Massive losses were held across the board, but it was a victory for the Allies, and Canada showed their might and their ability to contribute. It's said by some historians that Canada was regarded for very well-trained soldiers and their ability to strategize. Here's one example of that, flanking around and retaking some form of the high ground. Now let's jump back to Canada. Internal tensions were raising due to conscription. There was an issue with getting troops from Quebec, they called it French Canada, issues getting French Canadian troops at this point in time. People made the case that Canada had done enough, and our interests were not being served by the European conflict. They would rather have our men at home, growing food, and maybe creating weaponry in the factories instead, not on the battlefield. Some people disagreed with that, and they felt we needed to be more involved and we need more numbers. So this tension continued to grow. There were two sides, the people who did not want to be conscripted, and those who were considering it. So eventually, a government coalition pledged to enact conscription despite these notions and conflicting ideas. It was called the Military Service Act. 400,000 Canadians were enlisted, but 380,000 appealed it. So not many took it willingly. And as you can see, Canada was not okay with the idea. A lot of those people were not down to be sent off to war against their will. Tensions actually rose so high, it got to the point where anti-conscription riots broke out in Quebec, and four people died due to these riots. Now, back to the war. Germany was going strong at this point, and with Russia collapsing due to those internal rebellions, it made it easier for them to expand. That front was looking very victorious for Germany. At this point though, it was getting late in the war, and years had gone by, and soldiers were getting tired. There was a lot of death, and the conditions were terrible. You were living in a bunker in the ground, surrounded by bodies, blood, bullets, and everything else needed to recreate a living version of hell. It was a terrible time. People were searching for answers, and they wanted it to be done quickly. You can also look at what happened in Russia, and I'm sure that played a part in people's mentality as well. They saw that these citizens were getting tired, and they were revolting. In Canada, look at Quebec. There were riots that were being held that resulted in some people dying. This had to come to an end. So, what was the answer for that? Around this time, a new ally came to the forefront. Spring of 1917, America joined the war. Now, to provide support for the faltering ally lines, Canada and Australia, who are also involved now, sent further reinforcements and combined with America, the Allies were now able to muster a force that was strong enough to keep pushing into Germany. 
Eventually, Germany started to run low on manpower. They were depleted in terms of supplies. And with this new ally emerging, they were a fresh combatant, the US. It wasn't looking good for them. As these forces continued to push in, Germany was faced with the distinct possibility of an invasion of their own land. It was looking like a losing effort now. So they had to surrender and they signed the armistice agreement, which marked the end of World War I. Now that agreement is actually regarded with some scope of controversy because it can be argued that because of the way it was structured, it left Germany in the dust that led and sowed the seeds for World War II, but that's another tale for another time. So when all was said and done, Canada lost over 60,000 troops and many more returned with severe wounds to the body and to the mind. Imagine living in those conditions and coming back to civilization. It's a big change and this was before mental services were readily available for people. They sacrificed a lot. If it wasn't their lives, it could have been their mind, their well-being, maybe their family relations, the opportunity to grow with their children. All these things were gone, sacrificed to the war for them to secure the victory. Canada did gain a lot of respect from the international community given our involvement and we did learn some lessons. First of all, conscription, highly controversial and a lot of people are not going to be down with that notion. The second thing, when the government promises certain things are only going to be for the war effort, they're probably lying. Additional taxes were put on to people in the form of things like higher income taxes and property taxes because that was the excuse. We need more money to fund the war effort and they'll go away once the war is over. It never went away. And finally, we also learned what Canada is capable of doing. We were a relatively new country at the time, didn't have a lot of time to establish ourselves and we were going into that as a Britain considered force. We proved our identity at that point and we carved a name for ourselves. Today, we remember all of that and recall the tragedies of war, hopefully to never repeat such atrocities again in the future. World War III, we do not want that. So, that brings me to the end of today's conversation. If you enjoyed the content, be sure to leave a review and share. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Perry Platform. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you soon.